want to, I'm not, we're not gonna be able to spend a whole lot of time because we talked a lot about the screening test, but I wanted to talk about soft markers. And I'm going to give what my little, uh, uh, talk is when I'm trying to explain and then you can piggyback on that uh, as the as the genetic counselor. So, you know, as an maternal fetal medicine specialist, I'm doing the detailed ultrasounds and even earlier, um, hopefully have the antenatal screening on board and have that testing available. And then we see, we look for two types of abnormalities or uh, what we call defects or markers in a fetus. The first one would be a major defect. That would be a birth defect that does require management post-delivery, like a hole in the heart, uh, something, a, a brain defect, or cleft lip, cleft palate, something that is going to uh, alter the management of the baby once it's born. Um, some defects are more severe or significant than others. Not all of them are significant. And then you look at something called soft markers or minor markers. I call them minor markers and major defects, um, but they could be called soft markers as well. These things are not birth defects. They do not affect the baby. They don't have to be addressed after the baby is born. Um, but when we see them, uh, especially more than one, um, or if we see one and we don't have the antenatal screening, then it might alter how we counsel you about the risk of the fetus having a chromosomal difference. So for example, uh, what we're gonna talk about real quickly is choroid plexus cyst, um, echogenic intracardiac focus, the echogenic bowel, and there was another one, pyelectasis and single umbilical artery are the five most common, but you could look at short humerus and short uh, uh, femur as well. But those are the most common ones that are considered soft markers. And what's most important is once you see that, or we see that, if you're not already there for a detailed ultrasound, then you will get upgraded to a detailed ultrasound to look at more of the anatomy of the baby. Say you were low risk, otherwise you came in for just a basic routine anatomy scan, your antenatal screening was uh, negative or low risk, you get the uh, ultrasound, and now you see uh, a choroid plexus cyst. Um, a lot of these, if you have negative screening, there's nothing else to do. We don't have to offer any additional testing. Um, if you don't have the screening, then we need to talk to you about additional testing, whether it be uh, doing the antenatal screening because you're in that window, or diagnostic testing or something different depending on what we see. Um, but again, these are soft markers. So whether or not you have the antenatal screening, test coming into that ultrasound will affect how you're going to get counseled. counseled. Um, but just to reiterate, none of these things are birth defects um, that we that we see well, like soft markers. Yeah, um, and is they there anything also you would don't add diagnose to baby with any of these conditions. So um, while right. yeah, we, see, we see soft markers a lot, ultrasound. actually. We do. Um, mm -hmm. And there are what mm -hmm. we call likelihood ratios usually attached to them. So it's how likely a pregnancy is or how much it increases someone's chance to be affected with a specific condition when we see them. So when we see them, that allows us to do more math to figure out what your chances to have a child with that condition. And that can be based on prior screening, like Dr. Clark had said, or just based on age-related risk if you haven't had any prior screening. Um, and so when you hear about these things from your doctor, always ask about how does this change my risk for pregnancy but no provider should ever be telling you, oh, your baby definitely has this particular condition based on what these soft findings are on ultrasound. Okay, so I'm just going to go through real quick, um, and then I'm going to give a little bit about what we would do, and you add on anything if you want to add on anything. Let's talk about first about Cori Plexus cyst. If you've had negative antenatal screening, no additional testing is recommended, mm -hmm. and this is assuming this is all we see. Okay, so this is this, we're seeing what we call an isolated soft marker. Okay, when you start to see more than one, that will change things a little bit as far as your counseling and what's going to be offered to you. But if we're seeing an isolated choroid cyst or cyst, it, do, it doesn't matter which one, you know, whether it's one or a, a few. Um, if, as long as the screening is negative uh, that you had, then there's no other indication for uh, further workup for chromosomal differences. If you don't have any uh, uh, previous screening, then we're going to counsel you about uh, the potential for trisomy 18, which is one of the things that you could see our choroid plexus cyst in those babies that have trisomy 18. And then you will be offered uh, screening or depending how far along you are, what else we see, if we see anything else, uh, more significant uh, than the choroid plexus cyst, then you might be offered a um, diagnostic yeah, so, test. Um, so that choroid plexus right? cyst, they're not gonna hurt the baby's brain. And it's not cysts like right. we would normally think of cysts outside that they're pus filled and stuff like that. Um, most of the time they go away later mm -hmm. in pregnancy, even if they don't, they're not impacting the brain whatsoever. So it sounds scary to have a cyst on 
but it's really not a scary thing, I promise. Um, by themselves, they can be pretty common. Right. They are seen very commonly in babies of trisomy 18, but the reverse is not true when we don't see any other features associated with trisomy And that is a condition right. where we'd expect to see pretty significant findings on an ultrasound, other severe birth differences or more um, closer associated um, findings on ultrasound than just an isolated choroid plexus cyst. Good, good. Okay, echogenic intracardiac focus. Um, that is a bright area um, in one of the chambers or more than one chamber of the heart um, on the muscles that are within that chamber. Uh, same thing applies. If you have antenatal screening and you have the isolated uh, echogenic intracardiac focus, no other testing is needed. If you don't have prior antenatal screening and we see that isolated, then we are going to offer some kind of antenatal screening. Most often, uh, you know, it would either be a quad screen or if you're in that window or the cell-free DNA screening test, um, because the, again, the anatomy scan is typically done at 18 to 22 weeks. So uh, that, and again, it's not a birth defect. It doesn't cause, it's not a heart defect or anything like that. And it doesn't matter. None of these things matter if they are not seen later on. It matters when you see them in that window. So a lot of people say, well, will it go away? Well, a lot of times they do go away, but it still doesn't ma mean that I'm changing how I'm counseling you because right. I see it now. No, it won't even echogenic impact echogenic heart focus. function later on in life. They're not going to have a heart, um, a heart attacks because of it. And again, by themselves, they truly mean nothing. They're just normal variations. We see them pretty commonly on ultrasound. Right. Echogenic bowel is another thing. Um, although they, it is associated with aneuploidy, or chromosomal differences. It can be associated with cystic fibrosis, uh, congenital viral infections, uh, if there's something going on within the gastrointestinal tract, um, and also can lead to fetal growth restrictions. So this one is a little bit more complex. So we, you know, if you've had negative screening, um, antenatal screening, then that pretty much tells us it's probably not from an aneuploidy, or we don't have to worry as much about aneuploidy, but we still need to talk to you about those other things that could be associated with echogenic bowel. So if you are, you know, obviously if somebody in your family or you are a carrier for cystic fibrosis and then your fetus has uh, echogenic bowel, then obviously that's going to be ringing bells for us. That's what we, you know, we have to worry about. Um, so the recommendation is if you've had a negative screening, um, then you don't need any further workup for aneuploidy or chromosomal differences. Um, but you still need to have the conversation about cystic fibrosis and if there's any uh, potential for uh, fetal uh, uh, or viral infection exposure like cytomegalovirus would be one. So we would look at other markers for that as well. Um, and then we also typically recommend just another growth ultrasound in the mm -hmm. third trimester just to see how the baby's growing. Um, but in, and if you don't have the screening, we'll obviously recommend that antenatal screening to you. Anything else you want to add for the... Uh, the vast majority uh, sorry, of these are also bowel. still normal variants. About 85% of babies with an echogenic bowel do right. not have any of these conditions. Um, we offer um, scans right. at that follow-up to also assess the bowel to see if there's any bulging of the bowel that may indicate there could be a narrowing or a blockage somewhere within there, um, more than just looking at the growth. Um, but most of the time, again, it goes away. It's not of consequence to baby, but it is a more evolved discussion. And so your OBGYN may refer you to an MFM um, center or a genetic counselor to have that discussion with you because there's more than just kind of one particular condition it can increase chances for. Okay. And then pyelectasis, that's a renal uh, um, marker um, for uh, uh, fetuses. It's actually more common in uh, male babies um, or those with XY chromosomes. Um, basically, same thing. If you've had antenatal screening and you have isolated pyelectasis, there's no indication to do a further aneuploidy or chromosomal difference workup. However, uh, we would need to follow you uh, for a couple more time points in the pregnancy to look at that measurement again, because uh, most of them will... Mm -hmm turn to normal, but if they start to increase in the measurement or go into something like hydronephrosis, then that's something that needs to be looked at in the baby once it's born. So that's important. We don't just let it go. We will follow you depending on what that measurement is uh, at certain time points in the pregnancy for a follow-up ultrasound. If you don't have the screening test, then we're going to obviously recommend that you get it um, and so that we can look and make sure there's no increased risk for aneuploidy. Um, anything to no, add it's to pilot off marker for Down syndrome, it barely increases the risk for Down syndrome. So if again, if it's by itself, probably doesn't mean it, but consider screening if you haven't had any. Right, right. 
And then the last one I'm going to talk about is single umbilical artery. I just picked these five because these are the ones that we see the most and uh, that I counsel about the most. So the normal umbilical cord uh, or typical umbilical cord during pregnancy has two arteries in one vein. And some fetuses, they have one artery in one vein. So same thing. If you had antenatal screening before and it's negative, nothing else to do to check for aneuploidy. Um, obviously, if you see other abnormalities, and again, all these things, we see them, we're going to be upgrading you to a detailed ultrasound if you're not already there for an ultrasound, uh, a detailed ultrasound. Um, so if you don't have the screening, we recommend that you get the screening. Um, the other thing is single umbilical arteries, different institutions will do, have different policies. Some will follow with routine growth scans, and then some will just do another one in the third trimester. There's really no right or wrong answer. I don't see a lot of growth restriction cases in my, you know, in my years of practice with single umbilical artery, although there could, it could happen. Um, so we, uh, depending on anything else that's going on, will, like if there's diabetes or hypertension, we'll do serial or we will just bring them back if nothing else is going on in the third trimester for a growth evaluation. Um, this has nothing to do, people confuse it a lot with the insertion of the cord, umbilical cord into the right. placenta. That's a different thing. Okay, this is just the number of vessels within the umbilical cord. Instead of two arteries in one vein, you have one artery, one vein. Okay, no, Anything again, to add to by itself, it's artery? usually just normal finding. It can be very common in some pregnancies, especially in twins. So um, mm -hmm. it's always depending on what we all, mm -hmm. uh, additionally see on ultrasound. Right, so that, that goes over the basics of the soft markers. I hope that helps. Because I know patients are terrified, and I understand because they don't understand. You know, I can explain it just like this, and then they'll go and they'll start getting on Google and they freak themselves out even more. But really, um, when you have the antenatal screening on board, you get that ultrasound at 18 to 22 weeks. If this is isolated findings with these soft markers, they're more often than not lead to nothing else. Um, but you know, depending on like the echogenic bowel is probably the one that's a little bit more complex than the other ones because you have to think about a few other things. Um, but more often than not, it's just fine. And then the pilot is one that you need to evaluate later on in the pregnancy. Um, but uh, other than that, again, another reason why, this is probably my biggest argument actually for getting uh, the antenatal screening is it's so much easier to counsel a patient that has that when I see these soft markers. And it's so, so much less scary for them too because I can actually give them the numbers and explain yeah, things Yeah, 100%. Better. Does and that I make think sense? Someone had asked about a high-risk screening, but a n completely typical ultrasound. So um, ultrasound, just like those other screenings, are just screening. They're not going to diagnose baby with a chromosome difference, um, whether we find a d um, one of those things, or they're also going to going to eliminate the chance for a chromosome difference if we don't find any of those things. Um, about half of babies with Down syndrome have some sort of finding like we talked about on that ultrasound. Um, and about 70 to 90 percent of babies with trisomies 18 or 13 can have some sort of finding. So while a negative level two detailed anatomy scan is very reassuring for us not to see any of those things, it reduces your chance by 50% for Down syndrome and 70 to 90% for trisomy 18. So again, it's about asking your provider of what your mm -hmm. chances were before and how this ultrasound changes those chances. If your provider is not familiar with that, that's okay. Ask them to refer you to a genetic counselor. We know those things and we will talk about those things in detail with you. These are things Dr. Clark and I talk about on a daily basis with all of our patients. And so we're very familiar with doing all these different calculations specific to you, not what everyone else goes through. And I I think that's one of the limitations of Google is that it gives the very best and the very worst of experience, yeah. not what most people tend to go through. And it sure is not going to be specific to yourself. Um, and so what, I'll always ask for a referral to okay. someone who knows a little more about these things and can walk through that risk with you. Right. And, and then, you know, again, just like you said, mm -hmm. ultrasound is even a screening test. Having a normal ultrasound in the presence of normal or even abnormal antenatal screening test does not tell you 100% for sure. The only way to do that is with diagnostic testing, which would be amniocentesis later in the pregnancy or CVS, which is typically done earlier in the pregnancy. Um, but you do not have to do that. There are risks associated with those procedures. So if that's something that you're interested in, usually the MFM and or the genetic counselor could talk to you about those risks. Um, but it is, and again, it's it, in doing a diagnostic test does not mean that you are going to terminate the pregnancy if it comes back abnormal. Um, what it does, uh, what I find is it gives the patient a peace of mind, uh, either way, actually, if there are findings and they have a diagnosis, then they can prepare better. 
Um, if they, it comes back normal, then they can kind of breathe the sigh of relief uh, for the remainder of their pregnancy. So that's, um, you know, uh, diagnostic testing does have its benefits and, and it's positive.